in this video I'm going to introduce us to an idea that we're going to be kind of following for the next few videos which is how to find the irreducible representations essentially if we have a a reducible representation how do we find the irreducible representation and so uh, I mean essentially what we're going to be doing is we want to have so if we have some matrix that's like this and you know has all its different entries in here we want to somehow transform it until it's in a form where we have you know entries up here here and here and so then everything else would be zero and so we want to block diagonalize it and what that's going to do is essentially if we have some n-dimensional space so we have some n-dimensional space we want to turn it into something that has a I guess m-dimensional subspace plus you know some I guess s-dimensional invariant subspace and so we essentially want to sort of partition our our entire space into two subspaces one of which is invariant and then the other one is one that we can essentially get our our uh, irreducible representations from and so in order to do that the first thing I'm going to do here is introduce us to this idea of the direct sum and so the direct sum is essentially if we have matrices we add them up and put them in into the diagonals I mean we don't even add them we're essentially just sort of arranging them each of our matrices into the diagonals of a larger dimensional matrix and so for instance if we have these two three by three matrices then the direct sum would be something like this that would give us a six by six matrix where one of them is in that diagonal and the other one is in that diagonal then the sort of off diagonals here uh, are all zeros so we end up with a six by six matrix that looks like that uh, so where the original matrices as I said appear as diagonals uh, diagonal blocks in a new higher dimensional matrix and so that is the direct sum uh, so we can you know have it like this and we can do that for any of the group elements so we have these two mappings here of our group elements into matrix representations we can then form these block diagonals of all of the matrix representations of each one of our symmetry operations each one of our group elements uh, and if we do a similarity transformation with T then our new representation so we could take this block diagonal form and turn it into one that is not block diagonal uh, where equals means that they are equivalent representations and so essentially what we want to do is find a way to do this process in reverse we want to be able to take some matrix that looks like this so we have some matrix that you know has entries throughout the whole thing and we want some sort of uh, transformation like this so we have T there that then turns it into a matrix that is block diagonalized like that and so that's essentially what we're going to be sort of looking at in this in the next few videos uh, so to do that we have to change bases until we get a subspace spanned by a subset of the basis vectors uh, and have its complement invariant which is what I was talking about above where we essentially want to uh, end up with two subspaces so we have some n dimensional thing we end up with an n dimensional subspace and an s dimensional subspace uh, where the s is invariant and so we can perform transformations that only transform the things in the m dimensional part of the subspace so for instance if we have our c3v symmetry group with the triangle as we've been kind of using as an example we can have bases that make a rotation so we're doing a rotation that permutates the bases into each other and so that would be a matrix that looks kind of like this and so we are doing this rotation and it takes this x y z here and turns it into this z x y and so we're just permutating the different bases into each other 
but a change of basis could give us an unchanging Z basis while the X and Y bases span a 2D subspace. And so we could have something like this. So we are looking at this triangle. And so uh, these dotted or dashed lines are supposed to be sort of uh, beneath the, uh, the triangle here, sort of going into the screen. And so we have an origin here and these these bases here are sort of extending sort of sort of slanted outward toward the screen until we get to uh, these points on the triangle that are sort of in the plane of the screen and I have this sort of you know push to the side a little bit the origin here so that it's kind of like we are sort of looking at it at an angle somewhat uh, and so we do this transformation here so we do some sort of uh, transformation uh, transform here and so we end up with the Z axis here sort of sticking straight out so the dotted line as I said is supposed to be behind the triangle and then at this point it's sort of coming out of the triangle sort of sticking out of the screen and then the other two uh, are now you know sort of forming this this orthonormal basis or a unitary basis rather if we want to be more general about it and so now we can think of rotating this triangle you know as essentially just moving in the y and x basis while the z basis remains the same it remains invariant and so you know that would essentially take our our matrix which when we were using this blue one here that permutated our bases here we're sort of doing a transformation on it that changes it into something like this which is now block diagonalized so we have this part here in the square brackets uh, and then this one down here which is the invariant complement of these ones up here uh, and so we can just rotate in with these two dimensions rather than having to do it with all three dimensions as we had right here and so any mapping in the 2d subspace will have its image in that subspace and so essentially what that means is this one here this z just stays invariant and so it's only in these two dimensions here this subspace here where the transformation is actually happening and so we can say more generally when by means of a similarity transformation if all the matrix representations which form a group representation can be brought into this block form which is what we did up here then the representations are completely reducible so geometrically this means that we can find a basis in the representation space consisting of two sets of vectors s and p which are uh, which are subsets of g and where they don't uh, have any intersection uh, and so they are not mixed by a mapping of the group uh, and so that's essentially just saying that we have s and p so we're saying that this part here in the square uh, brackets is s and this one here is p and we see that they, they don't have any intersection so there isn't any component of the sort of s ones here that go into the the p subspace and vice versa and so that's you know basically what this is saying and then such a basis is uh, said to be adapted to the reduction of the representation all right, so the book I'm using gives these basic theorems here, which are sort of necessary for being able to perform this process. And the book goes through the proofs, and my lecture notes uh, have the proofs in it. I'm not going to go through it in this video. If you are interested in the proofs of these, then you can check out the lecture notes linked to in the description down below. I've tried to make it as sort of thorough and intuitive as possible but like anything when it comes to proofs of theorems it's all very abstract and you know to me at least in a, in a video series like this it ends up just being somewhat sort of I don't know unsatisfying I guess to go through the proof uh, but essentially what what we are doing is we take these three theorems here so any representation of a finite group by a non-singular matrices 
is equivalent to a unitary representation. Uh, so two unitary representations are equivalent, uh, then it is possible to find a unitary matrix which relates them according to a similarity transformation. Uh, and if a matrix is reducible to this sort of triangular form here, then it is completely reducible to this block diagonalized form. And so using these three theorems here uh, is essentially what will allow us to do uh, what we were doing above. Well, these three theorems plus Schur's lemma, which I'm going to talk about in the next video, and I'll, I'll probably actually go through the proof of that one. I think that one's a little bit more satisfying, but uh, essentially we're going to be using these three theorems and Schur's lemma. And so taken together, it establishes the possibility of a complete reduction to unitary form by unitary transformations. And so essentially we can repeat the process until we get block diagonals that look like this. And so, like I said, that's kind of what the next couple videos are going to be focusing on here is this sort of being able to take reducible representations and turn them into irreducible representations. And so when we have something that, you know, has this really high dimensionality to it, we want to be able to reduce it to the lowest dimensionality possible, you know. And as we've seen in previous videos, you know, getting something that's sort of one by one is somewhat ideal, but we've seen that we have those those two by twos, which are uh, sort of represented in our character tables by the E, and we can even have the three by threes, which show up in our sort of cuboidal sort of symmetry groups. Uh, but, you know, if we have something that's, you know, sort of N by N, where, you know, N is sort of, you know, greater than, I guess, three even, uh, then, you know, we want to be able to reduce it into these forms, into these sort of simplest irreducible forms. Uh, uh, but anyway, I hope you found this sort of introduction to this idea uh, helpful. And I will see you in the next video.